are in God. There's an awful lot in that passage. You probably do two or three sermons on it if you want to. But really what sticks out to me in that, that Jesus was chosen to be the Lamb of God before the creation of the world. God knew before he made us that we would all be sinners. Sorry, folks, we're all sinners. Every one of us. And so God had a plan, even way back before then, to reconcile himself to us. Jesus, God's only son, would have to be sacrificed for the forgiveness of our sins. Jesus would be the only one worthy. He would be the only one without sin. The lamb, without blemish or defect. Let us pray. As we approach Resurrection Sunday, it is important for us to remember that before Jesus could be resurrected from the dead, he first had to die. Jesus was sacrificed on the cross for our sins, and he did die. Our Lord, for oh, all oh, of great love you demonstrated on that day, sacrifice your only begotten Son to reconcile yourself to us. So, we are gathered here today to worship you which you have done for us, and to give you the praise and the glory that you so richly deserve. We ask you to be with us, O Lord, during this time of worship, and to draw us closer to your side. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Archaeological question. How does archaeology uncover the truth about Jesus? To help us this week, we've been assigned a real archaeologist to advise us and help us with our project. I've got a bunch of videos from my last trip to Israel. You're going to see someone on camera. His name is Barney. Super <laughs> awesome guy. He was my driver. He was a huge help while I was there. Anyway, you'll see. Let's just say it gets interesting.
for a heart rate. He might die on me. I think so. For our offering time today, I'm going to read this excerpt from uh, this uh, special edition of our daily bread that I was really uh, especially fitting for a book today. When Bobby, who was raised in a poor Scottish family, attended a missions meeting at the local village church, he made a decision to receive Jesus as his Savior. When the offering plate reached him, he asked the usher to place it on the floor. Stepping into it with his bare feet, he said, I don't have any money to give God, but I give myself. Bobby was Robert Moffat, who later became a missionary in South Africa. He worked tirelessly to share God's love, including translating all of the Bible into a local language. Motap and his wife gave themselves to serving God. His story of wholehearted giving brings to mind a story in Mark's Gospel of a poor widow giving what appeared to be a small offering at the temple. Jesus, observing and knowing she gave everything she had to live on, told his disciples that she gave more than all the others, making contributions. While the others gave from their wealth, she gave from her heart. Giving our all might mean serving people in another country, as Robert did, but it could mean serving God with passion right where we are. We can give our time, our financial resources, our prayers of intercession, and so much more. Just as Jesus recognized the widow's offering as a gift, God will see our heart and receive our offering with love. Let's pray together. Father God, all we have comes from you. Help us to give generously and with a glad heart, for you are the source of of all things. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll have the kids into the back. Good morning. How many of you guys are uh, Hobbit fans? Hobbit? Oh. We're going to have to have a smoking party, Mike. Very fun. I'll come. I'll come. I'll come. I think of when Gandalf says good morning and all that follows is, uh, is very good. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're out of the joke. <laughs> We're going to be in Colossians chapter 2 this morning. And uh, again, if you're new here this morning, we welcome you. We have been going through the book of Colossians for a few weeks now, and really discussing the supremacy and sufficiency of Jesus. And uh, it's interesting, the timing, because uh, I like that God often will uh, bring into mind by his providence a certain topics or books that I just... You know, choose, with the lack of a better uh, phrase, and you come to see how appropriate it is for the time that we're in. And what I mean by that is, uh, I don't have uh, some uh, intentionality at times when you see it come together. I guess what I'm saying is, it's interesting in our culture, we're seeing the culture shift so much to be very anti-God and anti-Christian specifically, and so uh, choosing this book, God has planned for a while of why we are studying it. But uh, the title of today's message, Totally Evergreen Sheet, is How to Be Complete in Jesus versus Human Wisdom. And so we've got to remember that Paul is writing to this group of, lack of a better, uh, is Turks. People that live in Turkey. And, but they've been uh, under the administration or influence of Greek culture since Alexander the Great, so for at least several centuries. And now... Rome had come and made provinces of all these areas, but the Greek culture was so extremely pervasive and influential. And so what, what Paul is writing, and he has, he has introduced the person of Jesus to them, they had become Christians, 
And now he's writing to them to remind them of the supremacy of this person, Jesus, whom they put their faith and trust in. But today, we're going to see this emphasis on uh, the contrast between human wisdom and what we know in the Bible. Now, how many of you, I want you to raise your hand here, how many of you have taken a philosophy class in college? Okay. Now, while you took that class, how did you feel? Stupid. Stupid? <laughs> because? She took it, not me. Oh, you all should. <laughs> she felt stupid. All right? I remember when I, uh, I took several philosophy classes, but the first one, of uh, the first three weeks, I'm like, man, this is awesome. This is great. The articulation, the uh, logic, the precision in making arguments. You know, you're getting out of Venn diagrams and you're looking at words. And I'm like, man, this, this is great. I love learning how to think. And I actually was very tempted. I'm glad I didn't. But I thought, man, this is so awesome. I'm going to go switch my major from theology uh, to philosophy. Because this is awesome, man. And uh, I'm glad I waited until about week seven. Because in week seven, I was in absolute despair and depression and discouragement because all of this human reasoning got us nowhere. I remember one class we spent, we were studying David Hume, and uh, David Hume was arguing against causality. I won't get into all of it. You know. But by the, we spent 50 minutes discussing whether, when it rains, whether the grass is really wet. <laughs> and I was like, did we just spend 50 minutes? And, and they go, yeah, yeah, but you know, you can't prove it because if you go out there and look at it, maybe your eyes are deceiving you. What if I touch it? Well, maybe your sensory issues are unreliable. And you go, okay. Maybe a demon has come and convinced you, and now maybe you're living in a, in a life of a, at least back then, this was Matrix times, you know, the movies. Maybe you're living in a simulation. And we're, I'm like, yeah, this is a complete waste of time. <laughs> wow, I'm glad I didn't change my whole, you know, life focus on this, because what, what we recognize is that, again, philosophy, what does philosophy mean? Anybody know the words? Love of wisdom. Love of wisdom. It comes from two Greek words, phileo and sophia, which is wisdom. So you have this love of wisdom, and we remember that, that the Greeks, okay, the Greek culture, Plato, Aristotle, right, um, very well known in, in all the development of really the best of what human reasoning can provide. And so Paul is writing to this group with all of their history and all of their traditions and saying, hey guys, I know you've had this, but do not get sucked into it. Because even though there's some interesting things in philosophy, again, it's not totally worthless, I'm not saying that, but you come and what you realize is that after all of the, you know, the millennia, or certainly this time centuries, they come to where they, what do they know is true? And not very much, because Especially with, again, some of the skeptics they view with others. You come and you go, wow, I guess, it, it, leading into the age of enlightenment, and you go, and, and you can see it trickle in, no doubt, to the church. And when this stuff came into the church, really I'm talking a couple centuries ago, you begin to see all of the major seminaries, Yale, Harvard, all these ones that were, they were founded for one reason, to train ministers. And then the skepticism came in, and then all of the, uh, the criticism, the higher criticism about the text and all these other things, and, and uh, pretty soon, now if you go there, do they believe this is the, the, the inerrant, infallible word of God that inspired God breathed? Not for one second! And so when we allow human wisdom to come in, it, it has... It, it's inevitable for it to corrupt us and to twist us. There was a, I was interacting with an email that was not sent to me, but I was, uh, somebody had asked me, hey, Bonner, what, what would you say to this? 
And the person that was writing the email, uh, they said, you know, I was a born-again Christian once. I was one of you evangelical types. I studied apologetics, you know, defending the faith. I've read more books about God than you can even imagine. But I've come to uh, believe that the Bible is nothing but a myth. And you're like, really? After all this study, and, and, and what he said in there was that your, so, your so-called God asks you to put your faith in something that is untrue or something that is contrary to the evidence or, in other words, for you to have blind faith. And I was like, man, you must have had some really bad books to read because that's not what I have found in apologetics. There's been some excellent books. And, and now you have tremendous scholarly Christian philosophers who address these issues. Now, one of the things that, that I responded back was, it sounds to me, because he said this. He said, um, I have no place for faith. And I was like, well, there, there it is right there. There's your foundation. You have said, you have made a demand, think about this. You go and you're out there in the middle of the field and you're talking to maybe God or whatever, or you're, you're at least attempting to, and you say, you know, if there is a God, I will only believe if you answer every one of my questions to my satisfaction. God says, next, hit the road. First of all, I'm God and you're not. I don't acquiesce to demands of my creatures. Who can we ask about that? Job. Biblical character. Who? Job. Job was making some demands. And, I, and that's why I responded. I said, you know, have this guy, he claims to have read everything, have him study for the rest of his life the book of Job. <laughs> because Job and this guy were saying, I will believe if. And so what I said was, look, we know that Hebrews 11.6 Without faith, it's impossible to please him. And God gives us enough evidence and enough facts to give us, well, I'll say it this way. This is kind of a harsh. In Romans 1, 18 through 22, Paul is writing about, he says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all the ungodliness and unrighteousness of man. But he says, but his invisible attributes are clearly seen because God has shown it to them. Therefore, they are without what? Excuse. Excuse. So God gives us enough, unfortunately, to condemn us. And he gives us enough that we can say, yeah, in my heart of hearts, God exists, and therefore on that day, when this guy or anybody else stands, God's going to say, sorry, your excuse is unaccepted. Well, yeah, but, no buts, I've given you sufficient evidence to know that I'm there. Have I answered all your questions? I never said I would. I never made that part of the plan. And so when we come and God says, yes, I've given you enough to show you that I'm here. And, and sometimes we know that God is more abundant. Uh, so most of us would say, I can tell you this, 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 how he answered my prayers, how I seen him act. And we know that. But here for this guy, what my response was, if there was no room for faith, there would be no room for pleasing God. That's just a logical deduction, right? Without faith, it's impossible to please him. Therefore, if it was all facts and evidence the whole time, there would be no room for faith. And God is most pleased when we respond in faith. It's not blind. God gives us enough to say, I'm here. This book is true. I've shown you that. He said, the Bible, I love that one. The Bible is full of inconsistencies and contradictions. And that was really hard to resist, you know, going, you know, and asking for those. But for us, what we see today, and we're going to see it more and more, especially in our culture, because... Our culture is becoming increasingly secular, right? And, 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 um, and harsh and critical and really uh, just 
unwilling to even think anymore. It's fascinating, if you go on in that Romans passage, because of man's rebellion against God as the creator, it says three times in Romans 1, 24, 26, and 28, that God abandons them. He turns them over. He turns them over. The, one of the scariest things ever is for God to say, fine, I'll leave you alone. Think about that. I'm going to leave you alone to yourself. Well, certainly, I mean, the devil, the world, the flesh, and the devil, God says, I'm just going to step back. And what God does in, in his wrath, one of his wrath, as theologians will call it, the wrath of abandonment. And he says, okay, you don't want me? Fine. I'll just let you continue in your path. And here we are going from the 60s, 1960s, when they took God and prayer to schools. And, you know, here we are 60 years later. And even if you go in increments, you know, go even 20 years ago. Yeah, it's really bad. It's getting worse. But then you go 10 years ago, and then you go like five years ago, and you go, oh, wow. When you look at the, one of the things that he does in verse 28 of Romans 1, as he says, God gave them over to debase. That's a kind of a, how do we define debased? Perverse. Perverse, that's good. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a immoral or, but it doesn't say God gave them over in this one. There's 20, 24 and 26 talks about God giving them over to um, really just disgusting and perverse behaviors, right? This one says, he gave them over to a perverse thinking. That their very thinking doesn't compute anymore. Right. They are unable to connect things logically and rationally. God is the author of logic. We wouldn't be able to, to think through things. You know, you, what makes us different than the animals? We have logic and rational thinking. They don't. They're instinctive, right? They're, they're, that's just the way that their nature is. But God says, part of my abandonment is that your very thinking becomes corrupt. So when we look at some of these philosophies and, and, and concepts and arguments, and you go, can't you see that if you go down this road, this is going to be the logical end? That's why I, I'll, I'll give you one example. It just blows me away is that there, the, the uh, I'm trying to think of it, I, I, maybe it's the state of Oregon, I don't remember, it doesn't matter. In, in this legislative body, I think it might even be in Congress, nevertheless, they get up and there's this huge vote about abortion. And they vote to uh, not protect the, the baby that's born. Okay, that's through abortion, they expect. So they don't do that. But then, like, the next day, the same guy gets up and he puts forward a, a bill that would protect kittens who were harmed in scientific experiments. And the, on the one side, they, they, got, they go, you guys are a bunch of hypocrites. You will say no to protecting a baby that has been born, you know, made it through abortion, but yet you will come and try to protect a kitten because it's harmful and it's inhumane. And, and so you wonder, and I don't know if it's hard. Was that a willful, deliberate choice? I'm sure it was. Or was it just a lack of the ability to see the absolute, utter hypocrisy? And that's very immoral. Certainly to elevate a kitten. I mean, to sit up there on your soapbox to protect a kid's life and yet to ridicule those who would seek to pr pr protect a, a human life. So as we come here, what Paul begins to do is he, he warns, let's jump in Colossians 2. We're just going to do three verses. So I'll read them and then we'll have some discussion here. He says in verse 8, Colossians 2, Beware, be on guard, lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Now, when he says the basic principles of the world, what's he talking about there? Who's the world here? 
This isn't mountains, sunsets, streams, rivers, which I like. He's talking about the basic traditions or the thinking that the world provides, right? How does the world think? Well, we know in 1 John 5, 19 that the world lies under the power of the wicked one. That the world is under his thumb. When, again, I see this, and we've we got to think it through. When the world says go left, automatically be suspicious. Automatically. And Paul says, don't let anybody cheat you according to the basic thinking of the principles of the world. The world is anti-God. It's very humanistic. It's very secularistic. Maybe even atheistic, if you want to say that. But when you, if you want to know, again, some of the hypocrisies, you look at the United Nations as an example. That's a great indicator of world thinking. Where on one hand, the, the, you'll have 100, there's 100, what, 200 nations, 195 nations. I'll just give you one example. You have the, the world getting together, and maybe 185 nations will vote against Israel as an example of, in, of uh, crimes against humanity. And you go, well, what about these guys over here in Zimbabwe or, or whatever that are actually committing genocide with swords, and they go, oh, yeah, we, we don't, we're not going to vote on that. <laughs> and you go, seriously? Here you have a country that isn't perfect by any means, but you have a democratic country, but you're going to vote, and then Israel is getting up there and calling them out of their hypocrisy. They don't care. There's no shame anymore in their hypocrisy. Or we go, can't you see clearly the thinking that what you're doing is illogical, uh, irrational even? And maybe they just don't care. Again, I don't know. Pardon? It's money. Well, and we do know that. Follow the money. He says here, for in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. That's, the, that's what we're after. We as Christians are complete in him, who is the head of all principality and power. Now, on the top of your sheet, I was thinking about this because when we think about being complete, there's this idea of, of having fulfillment or, ha or having uh, your being fulfilled. And what Paul is saying is, Okay, guys, there's a warning here for you not to be cheated. Beware, either by philosophy or human or worldly thinking. And I, I thought, what, what you have here, and I, I found a study that was done several years ago, where psychology, I'm not an anti-psychology person, okay? Just, just how, because psychology has a role. I see psychology as uh, one of the soft sciences, but what it does is it, it looks for patterns and behaviors amongst humans, amongst the soul, amongst the psyche, amongst the individual, and it looks for, it makes observations. Now, where I challenge sometimes uh, psychology is its solutions, okay? But if we're just making observations about the nature of, of humanity and how we behave and, and how we handle trauma, all the different kinds of trauma. Those are just observations, okay? We're just making scientific observations. I got no problem with that. But when they start making, again, the solutions on that side, it, that can be definitely problematic because um, when we think about, for example, what does psychology, uh, what is their view of the basic nature of mankind? Help me. As a non-Christian? As a non-Christian. Uh, psychology? That we're good. Of course. Yeah. Right? Yep. What does the Bible say? No. Yeah. Nobody's good. There's not good. No, not one. So, so imagine, here you have... Not one. If you make an observation, we both can make an observation that, that mankind Jesus. has a very universal problem. It's called sin. Well, they wouldn't call it that. They'd call it... What would they call it? Mistakes. Who was choices? Anti-social behavior. Anti-social behavior. <laughs> yeah, if we bring in socialism, that's even more challenging. Okay, you have psychology and then socialism, or not, um, sociology, I mean. So, when you look at this, some of the foundations in their solution to you is that, hey, if you, if you can fix yourself, and we go, well, yeah, we can make ourselves. Humans, even secular people, can make themselves better by certain things, and that's fine. But in reality, they're never going to solve the core problem, which we know is a heart of stone. 
It's, what does the Bible say about the heart? It is deceitful, desperately wicked, desperately wicked, incurably wicked. And you go, wow, it's deceitful above what? All things, Jeremiah 17, 9. You're like, ooh. I remember memorizing that years ago. And going, well, that doesn't make me feel good inside. You know? But the fact is, God says, hey, I've given you a new heart if you believe in me. That's not your heart anymore. You, you know, your, your new heart is stuck in this body. But here, what, I, what I've shown here is their observation that for, from a secular perspective, as they observe people and humanity, they say, well, you need these five things to have a sense of fulfillment or to feel complete. Number one, makes sense. You would feel loved. Well, naturally, we all want to feel loved, so they recognize, even without God, hey, if you have a, a, a good loving environment, there's a sense of fulfillment. Also, that you're free from guilt. Interesting, isn't it? That the secular world recognizes that if you are, if you live in guilt, you cannot have a sense of fulfillment. And you go, well, and for us, we always ask the question, well, where does guilt come from? Does the lion go have a pity party and cry after he eats the baby gazelle? We look at, at this, the world, God's world, and we recognize there's no guilt out there. There's no conscience. We know that conscience, and C.S. Lewis wrote a lot about this, that conscience is the defining characteristic that separates mankind from the animal world. And rational thinking, if you want to throw that in there too. But we go around, even as secular people, we realize that we have guilt. Generally, it might, it might be guilt against, because we've sinned against social norms. Maybe it's against another person, but generally it, that the, the things that lead to guilt are derived from social customs and traditions. Again, if you were in, in, in uh, Hitler's day and you were killing somebody, so that you wouldn't necessarily feel guilty. Because you have been convinced from a social perspective that you were doing right, but that but you know in the heart of hearts they probably knew better. Okay? Number three there, to feel accepted and wanted. The opposite of this would be abandoned. Naturally, why is it that secular people, even without God, have a need, maybe they to, to be desired or wanted by their parents? by a dad or a mom that they want their dad's approval, whatever, however dysfunctional that might be, they still long to have that acceptance. Also, number four, that life has a purpose. And also to live in hope and not absolute despair. So just keep those in mind for a moment. This is the way that the secular world is making these observations. So we're going to see two things. To be complete in Jesus, we must be wary of human wisdom and we must embrace all of who Jesus is. In regards to human wisdom, Paul teaches us to be a guard. This is, uh, th this is important because the question for us is, are you intentional in where you're thinking and how your thinking is shaped? You know, we, when I was a kid, my... my, my Teachers used to always say, garbage in what? Garbage, garbage out. And I never realized <clears throat> the importance of that truly until later. Because sometimes, especially if you're talking to somebody who hasn't sanctified their thinking, uh, you know, Romans 12, too, right? We're, we're, we're going to have our minds, what, transformed. Be transformed in the renewing of your mind. Do not be conformed to this world. And the Bible is very consistent that our thinking is not to be conformed to this human tradition, but to be renewed. So, thankfully, I mean, I was only 18 when I became a Christian, but 18 was still long enough to have a lot of worldly thinking. I was not raised in a Christian home specifically or the, or the biblical model. Um, so coming to the Bible, all of a sudden I was confronted with these thoughts and I was like, no, I don't believe that. Well, the Bible says this. It's like, oh. So, as, as, as life began to go, and I began to, you know, Scripture would say, Jesus says, we don't live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we come along, and, and we're getting introduced to theological truths and the wisdom of Jesus. And pretty soon, I, I had to go, well, okay, I believe this, but the Bible says this. So what's the solution? 
get rid of this and embrace biblical thinking. And the more and more it began to change and to wash and to cleanse all of the worldly thinking that was coming and to be just filled and absorbed with God's thoughts. God's thoughts about what? Everything. Go down here for a moment. You see there it says worldly categories? Well, what does the world say about God? Well, I want to know what the Bible says about God. What about religion? Well, the world says something. What about nature? Truth? The ability to have truth? Again, according to the skeptics and philosophy, you can't arrive at truth. What about life? Human nature? Are we good? Or are we inherently evil? What about the importance of humans? Ethics, sociology, law, politics, economics. God doesn't tell us, hey, you go have all of your own thoughts about everything, but when it comes to theology, then read the Bible. What does God want? All of our thinking. And the Bible, again, it's not a, a book specifically on politics, but it addresses it, doesn't it? It talks about render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's, render unto God that. We, we have these these political things we have as it relates to even law. I mean, most of our country is founded on the principles as found under Old Testament case law. I mean, Western culture, which has been a very good thing, you think about the idea of, for example, um, if you think about the, the, the philosophy of socialism as an example, what biblical principle would be very contradictory to socialism. Bob, I know you, you we've talked about this. You're on a blank, brother. Sorry, I, you know this. <laughs> well, what would we say? Uh, property, property is, is, is really important in the Old Testament. Property is important. Globalism, we saw this at the World Economic Forum, we saw it in there. You will own nothing. And you'll be happy. And be happy. We go, wait a minute. The Bible says I'm not allowed to steal, right? That's one of the ten. That's the big ten. And if I, if I steal something, that means that that guy actually owns it, doesn't it? Therefore, inherent within the Ten Commandments, or the way God established, is real property being really owned by a real person. And therefore, to force people to give it up, is it okay for the government to steal? I think in God's world... So, but we say, well, it's, it's the government doing that. Socialism. But like you say, hey, okay. But you look at these things, and what, what Paul is after is Colossians, Christians. You need to find out are you being cheated in your thinking? Are you being caught up and not finding your value and your fulfillment and your completion in the person of Jesus? In regards to human wisdom, Paul teaches that it is empty deception. It's interesting, too, that you think about uh, worldly thinking, or you think about Satanism. We're talking about fulfillment, but I want to ask a different question. What does Satan offer us, which is the world in some ways, what does he offer to make you happy? Let's be specific. Material. Material. I had a guy one time tell me that he said, um, well, I thought this was good. He said, he said, Mondo, uh, if you look at pastors, like high profile pastors, this doesn't be high profile. He says they often fall through three things. Gold, glory, and girls. Right. Okay. <laughs> and so I thought, well, this is pretty interesting that Satan comes, and what does he offer? Gold? Hey, and this isn't just pastors, but hey, you want to be happy? Let me make you rich. Let me give you, let me make you wealthy. And we know glory. What's glory? Success, right? Fame, power, position. And then under girls, I would just put pleasure, right? It could be drugs, it could be alcohol, it could be any of those things. And you look and you, you go and see what, and you see what Jesus, what Satan offered Jesus was all under those categories. Come on, Jesus. You don't glory for you. I'll give you all the kingdoms of the world and all their wealth. Okay? I'll give you 
you know, throw yourself off, you know, show yourself to be who you are. You'll get all the glory of having the angels come and rescue you. Man, they'll be like, ooh, this is the Son of God. Go outside, you know, just make the, the bread. You know, you know, get pleasure. Pleasure yourself by eating, right? It's, eating is pleasurable, right? I know you're hungry, you're starving, but you just need to fulfill those appetites. And you look, it's all ding, ding, ding. It hits them all. It's not just classmates. Right. The population ever got those three categories in prison. In prison. She works in a prison. Yeah. Satan offers all those things. And what we know is that they're all shortcuts to disaster. They don't provide long-term fulfillment or even eternal in that sense. So I've given you some things there in your sheet you can look up. In regards to human wisdom, Paul teaches that it is according to man. Here again, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ, but according to the tradition of men. I put some verses on the traditions. And it's interesting here too that um, think about it from, again, I, I love science, right? Science is good, okay? Empirical, testable, repeatable, provable, you know, let's put it in the lab, okay? But science is just one aspect of knowledge, of, you know, what they call epistemology. We can know, like, for example, they'll say, well, what are things that we know? How do we know what something's true? Well, we can test it. Right? We can drop something, we can do some gravity, we can do speed, we can do, look at some physics, we can look at biological laws. But, let me ask you this, how much does love weigh? <laughs> well, I guess love must not be real. Huh? Is love real? Yeah. It is? Or is love simply just the way that your chemicals in your brain are interacting? See, that's what, if we, if we neglect the full range of knowledge, and we only do it from a science, then you can't weigh love. We go, oh, I guess it must not be real. The Bible says, no, 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 I made you more than just a bunch of cells. I made you in my image. I made you after me. And we reflect the, the relational character, the societal character of God. I mean, here's the thing. The study of sociology begins with God himself. Why? That's a good trivia question. What's sociology? How we interact. How multiple people interact, right? And God is a trinity. The very foundation of sociology is, well, let's look and see how the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit interact. And it's a beautiful thing to see how they serve and exalt and glorify and seek the, the, uh, the honor to somebody else. And God says, I just want you guys to be like us. I've created you to be the community. Therefore, one of the, the highest qualities of somebody being a disciple of Jesus is that we love one another. All of the Bible, the love one another, to love one another. Well, where does that come from? Well, that's sociology. That comes from God himself. Because the Father loves the Son, and it says that. The Son loves the Father. We have this, this foundation here. But when we think about this, the question for a, here's the question. Are you still unlearning things from your past? Yeah. I hope so. Sometimes I go, oh, why am I thinking like that? And God's like, oh, yeah. where did you learn that from? It's like, well, I learned that from being a human and a sinful human. I learned that from just survival. How many things do we learn just from surviving? I had a buddy of mine that he... Um, he was raised on the streets. And he was involved in our church and became good friends with him. And uh, he had a tremendous time on learning behaviors. He, he would be very manipulative. And people didn't want to be around him. Because you know, you know, have you ever said, oh, you know, like um, little kids sit there and little kids says, oh, well, and, and, you know, if you're eating ice cream or something, then, oh, I wish I had some ice cream. You know, oh, I love ice cream. And it's all this passive, you know, manipulation, or, oh, I wish I had somebody to help me. Or, you know what, hey, how's it going? Well, my truck broke down, I'm late on my rent, my electric bill's past due. And you go, oh, really? Why is he telling me that? 
donations. <laughs> it's a passive solicitation. And I knew that about him. But when others would meet him, and it wasn't long before he asked you for 20 bucks. So every time the people now became very, they were not scared, that's what word. They were just reluctant to say, how are you? Because they knew they were going to get the sob story. And you're like, and so, you know, but he, the church, unfortunately, the church helped him for so long, and then they began to just avoid him. And then, then as the pastor, they, they would come to me, and I'd say, hey, look, I'm not saying what he's doing here, right? But did you know on the street? And I remember asking him one time, and, and he said, you know, some, when I was younger, in my teens, I had to survive uh, by accompanying males. You guys know what I'm saying? And I was like, and so he was abused just to survive. And I said, has that ever happened to you? Did you have to do those things to survive on the street? Can you have a little bit of compassion? And that here he is, you know, being abused and, and for his situation. And he had, again, he had to, um, he had to really unlearn these, his thinking, this manipulation, because that's all he knew. And it took him a long time. Sadly, he, he died last year at 52 years old. Because of all these things, he's just had a tough, tough life going over and over. And, and uh, but you're like, it, it, it's, granted, we, Sometimes he asked me for money. I would say most of the time I gave him money, but sometimes I would say no. So I was like, no, you'll figure it out. But other times I'm like, man, you'll have the poor with you always, right? Yeah. Jesus said that. But it, it was just to me, I, the reason my heart leapt out for him is because he was put in situations where the world just chewed him up and ate him, and spit him out. And then he came to know the Lord, and he actually was very, very good at scripture. Uh, it was hard for him to transform his mind because of a whole bunch of other things. But for us, the question is, is are we unlearning? Now, here's the other thing. Here, the standard of... Here, here, I'll give you an example. When we think about God's created world, what does the world... What's the typical worldly view about creation? Big Bang, evolution. Oftentimes, when I was in my classes, I would ask that my astronomy professor certain questions, and man, I would just, just dig at them. And uh, I'd say, well, you know, where'd that singularity in the beginning come from? And I'd point, well, you know, and I'd say, no, no, that's not an answer. Where did, it, where did that matter, right? Matter can be needed to create and destroy. We know that in laws of thermodynamics. Where did that come from? He says, well, now you're asking theology questions. And I'd be like, well, why did you say it was theology? Yeah. Doesn't science have an answer for that? It was when well, all the laws of physics began after the Big Bang. How do you know that? <laughs> but it's interesting to me that today, when you think about evolution and some of these others, which is worldly wisdom, the answer to that generally is, well, if it wasn't true, then why do the majority of scientists claim that it is? That's not an argument. That's called a fallacy of, of seeking whom the majority opinion is. And again, what do we expect the majority of the world to proclaim? The Bible? You're a glorified slime ball. You're mud. You're a worm that has evolved long. And so I go, hey, just because the majority of such and such claims this, just go, hey, honestly, if you want a spiritual equivalent, um, was the majority right who voted to crucify Jesus and crucify Jesus and claim to crucify Jesus? That majority was certainly wrong. We have to be careful that when we think, in our thinking, that we don't just side with the majority. And secondly, why would we by default, or just innately, trust what the world is telling us, or the majority, and, or even the government, for one sense. 
What Paul is saying here is, think critically, people. And think firstly and foremostly with the scripture in your mind. Do not beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men and the basic principles of the world. This is why in 1 John 4, when he's talking about the world, he says, don't you know that when the world speaks, it speaks to itself and the world listens to it? Don't be like the world. Don't even listen to the world. Now again, I can think for myself, if the scientists say that the sky is blue, I'm not going to be like, well, I don't know, I'm not automatically going to believe that. But what I'm going to say is, well, I'd like to see the evidence for that. Don't just pull out rank. Uh, you know, there's some credibility, but God has given all of us the ability to think through things. And when you look about, when you think about these earthly things, you think about what Jesus said to Nicodemus. If I tell you about earthly things and you don't accept it, how can I even tell you about heavenly things? So when we come in these earthly realm, we come and we go, okay, uh, I'm going to disagree with you here, I'll disagree with you there, that's fine enough, here's what the world says about that. I'm not scared of science, but I also recognize that there's a greater level of depth to knowledge that's beyond just putting something in a test tube. You know, God hasn't been put in a test tube, therefore God doesn't exist, right? Can't measure him. But we look and we go, if this is true in the earthly realm, how much more in heaven? So when we look at our culture, it's interesting now, and, and I see this, I was going to play a clip, but I thought that I would probably talk too much and wouldn't have time for the clip, but um, there was a clip that Bodie Bauckham, uh, he was talking about critical race theory, and again, this is something if you don't know about it, just go on and put Bodie Bauckham on YouTube, critical race theory, and, and he does a great job, it was like an hour and a half long uh, message that he gave, but one of the things that he talks about in there is all of this is infiltrating into our culture. Yeah, remember we talked about being woke, about being uh, having your conscience awakened to see that racism is everywhere. Well, one of the things that he, he, he showed, he said, I want to read you. I'm not going to say nothing. I'm not going to say anything about my opinion. He goes, I want to read you out of this book, this, which is the main textbook in all colleges as it relates to ethnic or um, uh, human studies. And he, he went through and he listed all these things about critical race theory. But at the end, he says, he, he was reading and he said, the, the writing, we have to be careful about Christianity. Because Christianity seeks to go out and under the guise of love, evangelize or proselytize others. It uh, confronts and condescendingly tells other people that their views are wrong. Therefore, it is evidence of the, um, of the group that we know as oppressors. <laughs> this is what's being taught. Anybody that takes a, a, a humanities course, and now it's coming into the church, this, this foundational thinking, this worldly thinking, and you go, I, I really, how can you as a pastor, or, or you see this in the seminaries now, how can you endorse this? Where by definition, Christianity as a religion is oppressive. And you go, well, if you look at the origination of Christianity, it was spread by people who were the oppressed. Mm -hmm. Jews were under Roman bondage. And then you have Christian Jews being persecuted by the, the oppressors or the authorities of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Saying, by definition, it's wrong. And they talk about how there's no such thing as truth with the capital T. For us, we go, oh, can't get into that. In regards to even wisdom, Paul teaches that is according to Satan. Now, the second thing is quicker. To be complete Jesus, we must embrace all we notice. We are to acknowledge Jesus as he, look at verse 9, for in him, he's talking to the, the Colossians, for in him, in Jesus, dwells all the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. Talk about 
about taking this that theology right there, going into the arena of ideas and saying, no, Jesus is God. And therefore, whatever Jesus says is fact and is universally true. You know, we don't believe in truth. Not like that. Nothing that are absolute. And Paul's saying, don't you dare allow your thinking to get sidetracked into anything that would contradict this. And that's why Paul, in the beginning, he, he establishes that Jesus isn't the Savior for Jews only. Jesus isn't the Savior for Christians only. Jesus is the Creator of humanity. Therefore, if he's going to be the Savior, it's of the world. There are no other options. It's fascinating to see Paul start that out. I thought, I'm glad he did that. He said, oh, it's for the Jews only or for those living in, you know, the, the land of Israel or the, the, you know, the Roman Empire. No, no, no. Jesus is the exact identical image. And he's the creator and he holds all things together. Therefore, what he says is true. Well, that's why, again, when we get in the arena of ideas, well, it's your opinion versus my opinion. Who are you? You're nobody, because we're, we're at human and human, we're at this level. What we need is for somebody that transcends us, which happens to be the creator, to come and to speak truth for everybody. So we go, well, if the creator says it, that settles it. It doesn't even matter whether I believe it. When he says it, that settles it. And it's going to be settled on that day when humanity comes and stands before him and they go, well, there wasn't enough evidence. He says, no, you're without excuse. There's enough evidence for you. You just suppressed that truth in unrighteousness. He says, if you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power, to embrace Jesus is to recognize his sufficiency and to embrace his sovereignty, to realize his sovereignty. That principality and power here are angelic realms. It's, it's this idea of the spiritual realm. Those beings that are above us. And Jesus is even far above that. Now here's the question. Let's go back up to the top of your sheet. We'll end it here. When we take the gospel, and we take the person of Jesus, and the relationship that we have with him, number one, do we feel loved? Oh, man. This is the essence. This is talking about fulfillment. How do we... Come to that place, not just feeling, but of being complete as a human. Man, we put Jesus in there. Man, I feel loved. Why? Because John 13 teaches Jesus loved them to the end. He loved us before the foundation of the world. He demonstrates his love and then he died for us. What about with Jesus, can we be free from guilt? Oh, man. That's one of the best fruits of the gospel. That the Bible says that when you stand before him, there is no one ashamed. Because the guilt's been washed away. Not only the sins, but the guilt, the feeling, the response. What about accepted and wanted? Mm -hmm. Ephesians 1 says an exact thing, that we have been accepted into the beloved. Ephesians 1, 5. You go, wow. You mean, what's the opposite of accepted? Rejected, abandoned, right? And I, we were talking, Mike and I were talking earlier this week that my favorite verse in the entire Bible is Hebrews 13, 5b at the end, where God says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you or abandon you. And to me, Mike said, well, why is that your first favorite? I go, you know what? If God is with me, then what else do I need? And I don't need anything else. That's it. That is the, the highest level of, of comfort for God to say, man, I am right here, mother. You can't even get rid of me if you try. Because I have made a covenant with you. I have saved you. And when you get out of line, I'll spank you, but you're my kid. You cannot get away from me. Oh, that's really nice. That's really comforting. Again, the, the worst thing, as Romans 1 says, is for God to say, fine. I'm just going to walk away from you then. I'll leave you to yourself. Oh, please don't. That would be horrible. Leave me to my own thinking, my own worldly thoughts. 
of my own behaviors? No, Lord, please don't do that. Number four, with Jesus and the gospel, does our life have purpose? Oh, man, not just for this life, but for eternity. And you see again in, in Ephesians 1.5 where it says he's predestined us forever to be holy and to be blameless and to be part of his kingdom. If anything, we have the greatest purpose ever. As a, as a Christian with the gospel, do we live in hope? There's no greater hope. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 4.13, we don't want to be like the world that when somebody dies, they grieve because they have no hope. We just go, what's well, death to us? Death, I get to go be with Jesus. This is awesome. There's no soul sleep. I'm not in the, in the grave. My body, who cares about that? I'll get a new one. Maybe I'll get it actually 2.0. It'll be even better. I look forward to that. Death, that's my doorstep into God's immediate presence. That's awesome. Death has no... Uh, bondage on us. It doesn't hold us in fear. Jesus came to destroy that. You go, and so when we look at the world psychology, they look at these five things and they recognize that in the heart of man, for them to have a sense of even earthly fulfillment in these five things, and we go, then you put the gospel there, you have that on steroids. We have it all, not just now, but for eternity. And this is where I think psychology, we have the answer. We have the answer to all of the innate, innermost needs of mankind to have a sense of completion and fulfillment. And that's why Paul, he says, if you want to be complete, don't look to human wisdom. It's found in a person. Do you stand and pray? Father, well, as we come this morning, we are here truly to exalt you, to worship you, to glorify you, to give you honor in our words, in our song, in our hearts. All of us are at different places, Lord, but I pray that as we get rid of the garbage in and we replace it with the truth of your word. And most importantly, replace it with the truth of the person of Jesus. Jesus is sufficient. He is the answer to all of our innermost desires of fulfillment, of completion, of satisfaction. Knowing that even in the difficult times, we have your presence. That we can have hope. The world cannot offer that in the moments of adversity. When they die, according to them... They're just going back to be warm food. They came from worms and they go to worms. What a depressing view. But we thank you, Lord, that we have the truth of your word. I pray that you would challenge us to consider our thinking, that we would take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you love us, that you've demonstrated that so clearly. That we would make that commitment to continue to follow after you receive Jesus in real life. I pray this all in his name. Amen.
doing that forever together. It will be really nice. Looking forward to that. I hope you guys have a great Sunday, and we will see you guys next week. Remember uh, that Resurrection Sunday is coming up, and uh, tell your friends. Bring them in here.